my name's Imelda Davis, traditional name Wazakam. I'm the chairwoman of Australian South Sea Islanders Port Jackson, which is here in Sydney, Piermont. As an organisation under-resourced, we've been advocating for change, uh, for the inclusion of Australian South Sea Islanders uh, in programs and services, especially with government, and to be included as a part of the great Australian narrative that we celebrate as a multicultural society. We are considered the forgotten people. Now, Australian South Sea Islanders are the descendants of some 60-odd thousand that were brought here from the islands of Vanuatu and Solomons. 95% of the trade were men and 5% were women. My grandfather, that's my mother's father, was 12 years old when he was taken off the island of Tana in Vanuatu. He and two friends swimming on the beach and then being called upon the ship by a foreigner, something that was unusual, a white man, coercing, coercing. He never saw his family again. This year marks 25 years since the 1994 Commonwealth recognised Australian South Sea Islanders as a distinct cultural group through the lobbying of Mrs Faith Bandler and many community leaders uh, supported by the Human Rights and Equal Opportunities Commission. We hope that this year it will impress on the government the importance of focus on policy programs and services for Australian South Sea Islander inclusion and recognition. Where I live here in Piermont, which is very fortunate, for the last 20 years, I overlooked the Sugar Wharf. Now, the Sugar Wharf is a um, CSR refinery known back as far as the 1800s or so uh, to receive sugar from these plantations all across Queensland and New South Wales. Benjamin Boyd Road runs here. He bought the first Canucks to Eden, New South Wales. You know, there's a lot of truth telling to be told. Queensland, Townsville, Robert Towns, notorious Blackbirder. Townships are named after these people. John Mackay, another notorious Blackbirder, celebrated rightfully for their um, establishing townships and societies and their entrepreneurialism and being the great, uh, I guess, achievers that they are. But no one man was an island and they did that on the backs of blacks. South Sea Islander labour. And yet my grandfather's story, Auntie Shireen's grandfather or chief line, Tom Tiplomata family story, is not told. And, and there's thousands of us that contributed to the success of this nation. There's the uh, cemetery still in Mackay there that they're still uncovering. Um, and it was callous. It, it was dismissive of, of black people, dismissive of black people, black men. We were something, nothing. And it still seems that way today. Australia is the third largest sugar provider in the world. There's a lot to be said about the economic stability that Kanakas gave to this country. Through blood, sweat and tears, no one benefited from this trade. We don't sit here before you wealthy, rich in, I guess, our, our sense of belonging as a part of the First Nations community, our families that have survived. But in terms of economic stability and equal opportunity, we still suffer significantly. My grandfather was brought over from uh, Vanuatu to build the sugar industry. My father was a gun cane cutter who helped cut all this cane in the old days. And uh, sadly, we built this industry. Now we all suffer from sugar diabetes. It's an industry that's killing us. And I'm wondering, uh, when are we going to see a miracle happen that will cure us of all these incredible sicknesses and diseases from the industries that we help create in this country?
sugar. It's as natural as... Hello, sunshine. Nature shining through the sugar cane. Bringing that great taste back again. Hello, sunshine. Hello, sunshine. Hello, sunshine. You're a natural part of life. Sugar. It's as natural as sunshine. Hello, sunshine. I was born at Tari, which is my dad's country, which is the Aboriginal name for Tari is Burupai. Each Wednesday was ration day where we get a box, a, a box full of tea, a tin of sunshine milk, a bag of sugar. Sugar came in a big bag. I've gone blind through diabetes, okay? But I can still hear, I can still smell. I can smell the gum leaves. <laughs> I can feel the breeze on my face. I can see the leaves swaying. I'm not completely blind. I'm just 1% left in my right eye. Completely blind in the left eye. But it shudders. See, I just walked on the bark. The crackling. Oh, I love that. That's what I miss. Uh, just these sounds, walking bare feet on the ground. I can hear it, but I can't feel it. And that's from white men's disease, diabetes. <laughs> Some 15,000 people died as a part of this trade. A lot of these people lost their lives within the first six months due to common disease, coming to a foreign land and catching the flu, chickenpox. We need to sit alongside our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families. As a part of that trade, we were brought in and placed on the same missions uh, stations, plantations, and worked alongside each other in a sugar slave trade. And uh, this is something that is evident of our kinship. There were some 3,000 Sassy Islanders that established the coming of the light um, when they celebrate Christianity coming to the islands in the Torres Strait called July 1 or Zulai 1. Um, that's celebrating the South Sea mob that came through and contributed to Christianity and the ongoing development and are still there today. So even our own mobs find the complexity of this history that's occurred um, challenging at the best of times and don't understand the history. That's why we need to sit alongside our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families in the curriculums as a part of this Australian narrative and be recognised as such. We celebrate multiculturalism, but really, First Nations people and Australian South Sea Islanders and the South Sea Islander ancestors are being bypassed. The old ways, the way they worship and they, they just have such, such a freedom. They know how to connect. They know how to present themselves. And now this, this new way of, of, of doing things, it's actually, there's, there's certain way you got to dress. You see when the, when the, when the missionary came they, they, they put a lot of stuff on us. They, they told us there's certain things that have to be changed. Within myself personally, I really want to have the freedom in doing things the way I want to do it. Then I've got this religious side of, uh, of things now that tells me that uh, I got to dress certain way, I got to talk certain way, I got to I got to do things certain ways, and I'm trying to present something that is really not me, and 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 it's right across everywhere, and that is the conflict that is there because you have the older people saying this is how you do it, and the young people say now this is the old way we'll do this, so there's 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 this this unity and this harmony right across. Uh, the community.
lakukan dengan berbagai chips. Kita menang jari people. Thank you so much for welcoming us and the South Carolina people into your land. And thank you for the warm welcome that you have given to our people that live in this country, the South Carolina people. So, thank you too much. Kali yang dua, kali. Jangan dihitung deh, jago. We all welcome you here. Malandali country. Please come through. Australia had civil society long before Captain Cook came here. People were trading with the islands. First Nations mob were travelling and exchanging. Let's get back to that and let's understand the truth around that connectedness that once was. Before European contact, uh, my people believed in a great spirit uh, and we call him Ganya in our language and um, he was a, a, a higher spirit who taught our people a lot of the things that we know today. Um, and a good example of that is um, the making of fire. I would like to take you on a journey. Can you imagine you're with your brothers and sisters playing on a beach and a small boat pulls up. As you and your siblings approach to take a closer look, you're grabbed and pulled into the small boat. Some of your siblings escape and run. However, you're forced in and before you know it, you are leaving the shoreline and the beach where you played and the village where you lived. You are then taken to a large ship Put into a hold where there are other children just like you. Here you sit, afraid, and wish you were back in your village. As the days pass, more young people are thrown into darkness with you. Eventually you are let out of the hold and into the sunlight, clothed, and you are marched off with a group of other young people taken away. Eventually, ahead of you, you see fields of sugar cane. As a young woman, my grand, great grandmother was one of the few young women amongst the young men taken from their village to work in the cane and other primary industries in which this state of Queensland was made. These were young, strong men and women with strong cultures, languages, and came from vibrant traditional village and family lives. My name is Sonia Minicon. I'm a proud descendant of the Cubby Cubby people of Southeast Queensland, but also of the people of Vanuatu. We need to look at our history in order to move forward. We need to reconnect the families here in Australia amongst our First Nations mob and South Sea mob, as well as in the islands. We need to know where our people come from. My mother's uh, family were from um, Tongoa in uh, Vanuatu. born in air and uh, we lived uh, a lot of uh, blacks lived on Plantation Creek um, both uh, Aboriginal and South Sea Islanders. You didn't have time to think about anything or think about anything else or you just got to work for the day and uh, that money was used for food and all the rest of it. And, um, you know, I think everybody gave tithes at church and whatnot, but it was certainly linked up in a tough discipline. There were about over 
over about, could be in about 20 families, um, all blacks. Um, they were uh, quite uh, a religious community. Um, uh, they came from uh, like a Pentecostal background. I've thought about that, that how they could sort of dance in the, in the Holy Spirit. And I was just wondering, what is it and to speak in tongues? What is it? That's, that's, I've thought about that most of my life. I've always been cynical about the role of uh, churches in the, in, the, in the community. I recognize they're good, but um, while we went to church, we were barred from the swimming pool and the, uh, we had to sit in a different part of the uh, picture theater if we went, that was uh, allocated to blacks. So um, I just regarded as uh, the churches had their heads in the sand. They, to me, equated the white Australia policy with a hand from God. This is the road to Pinnacle Pocket, the old mission that used to be here. This used to be all bush here before. It's all corn, cornfields now. This is where the uh, houses started here. There would have been about about 200 uh, Aboriginal Islander people living in this one little area here. The only thing that's left standing here is uh, of that old memory is this old church here. That One of the most farcical things, actually be humorous if it wasn't so, so true, that the ways in which the church leaves these buildings, their buildings, in such incredible disarray in Aboriginal communities. Look, I'm standing here, right in the old pulpit that my father used to use back in the old mission days. Everybody sang in the church and they could sing. They could play the guitars, the organ, they could chop it. Mmm. Yeah. So, that was Sunday school and mmm. In this church that's owned by the Assemblies of God Church, it was their building. It was their mi mission, their ministry. And yet down in Sydney they've got a Ministry down there worth $50 million. It's not going to cost $50 million to fix this place up. Just only a one day's take from their offerings would make this place beautiful and kept in heritage condition for Aboriginal people for future generations. It was, we uh, say, to a lot of good, a lot of prayer, and yet my mother. Um, who's uh, from the chief line, Chief Tom Tiplamata in, in Vanuatu, um, on the island of Tongawa. Um, she, even though the Bible was at the elbow, um, she just said, uh, these people, referring to white people, as being common as mud, and you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. Um, I wondered how that when I get older, when I get older, how that equated with the um, with the teachings, teaching of religion. So, but that's how we grew up. And my father, father's mother, was a full, full blood Aboriginal from the Burdekin. Um My father's father, Michael Henaway, um, he was. Speed. He was killed by the by Aboriginal people and men around that area, and I think it could have been over Grandma, because whether she was promised or he took one of the women, but he was they done, they done him. Yes. I once, I once was lost. 
But now, now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Twas grace. We had um, white family over the road, but the young boy wanted to come and play with us, but uh, my mother just pointed a finger up in the air and told him to get, so we weren't allowed to play with white kids, and uh, white people were regarded as uh, just as um, common as mud. And this was by a religious mother. If that's not racism, I don't know. Mm. So and it um, some, some things stay with you, um, and it's just like uh, you can have a, a burden through a burden through family, um, but you get into the wider world and you, then you make your own decisions and um, I have many, many white friends, good people. need to be recognised for their contribution uh, to this nation. Auntie Benita Marba, who just passed away, um, traditional owner of, of Palm Island, but also very proud woman Tana from Vanuatu. And that was something that she went to her grave in, in, in wishing that, you know, the government would do more for Australian South Sea Islander recognition. when you walk around our communities, our Indigenous communities, First Nations mob, you will see the evident stamp on people's faces as to being descendants of those Pacific nations. The solution to what's happening for First Nations mob, Australian South Sea Islanders and marginalised communities is truth-telling, the importance of empowering the people to resolve their issues. You can't have a top-down approach to how you deal with marginalised communities. You have to empower the people. We're excluded from the, from uh, the, the just the recognition just of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. We're excluded from the recognition of the historical aspect of this country. And to, to say to bring in a white Australia policy and to deport blacks, they didn't do it in America, honey, but they done it here. Today we have skilled, educated, savvy mob out there that are striving for excellence and that have the solutions to some of the issues that they live and deal with firsthand. Australian South Sea Islanders have been pushing for recognition since the early 1900s, breaking out of that slave trade, you know, to be treated you know, equally from a human rights perspective. People have had their birthright stolen, taken away. I don't want my children to deal with this same issue. So it's up to us as a collective, as the great nation that we are, or say we are, to work together and make it right. It's a big issue lurking here and it won't go away. Mm -hmm.